what's the rent you're paying if you don't mind we are paying 15% over 135 i think we took okay. it at 135 around 40 and now probably some are close to 160 right now okay so 160 per uh, rupees square per square feet. foot per month okay and you mentioned it's 125000 square feet yes so if i do the math quickly it's around 1.5 crore a month kind of a thing that's true got it very very nice but when nobody is looking at each other directly there's more collaboration that happens Hi everyone welcome to conversation with Kushal once again today we have with us the founder of Fractal Analytics a company with a market cap of rupees 12000 crores company having revenues of rupees 2000 crores with 4500 employees and not only that this person is also the founder and trustee of Plaksha University and has a lot of academic as well as diversified achievements thank you so much Shikant for taking out time it's an absolute honor to host you today and it's going to be a lot of fun hosting you great to see you Kushal Uh, looking forward to the conversation likewise so shikan i mean like uh, you've built this entire company from scratch you are also like a uh, born entrepreneur as such you you had mentioned once that you always wanted to get into entrepreneurship etc a lot of my audience in my social media are people who are aged between 18 to 24 25 and they also want to venture out and start entrepreneurship ultimately after a point in time what's your advice for all the aspiring entrepreneurs and how can they think of let's say starting something of their own and how do they plan everything I grew up uh, in a very conservative household where my father used to believe that there's no such thing as an honest businessman an honest businessman is an oxymoron so I grew up thinking I'll work for big companies and really uh, secure a good career but never start working I think a couple of things changed in my life because of which I turned entrepreneurial and I'm really happy that I turned, became an entrepreneur first thing was I met with Narayan Murthy the founder of Infosys in a business ethics class during my uh, during my business school and uh, i really liked him it was a, infosys was a small company just 50 million dollars at that time which year was this uh, this was 1997 and uh, i was really taken in by his honesty his ethics and his the way he was building the company and i thought that this india is different from the india that i had grown up with in the 1980s and 90s and therefore maybe i could do entrepreneurship the second assumption i had about starting a business was that back in the in the 90s i thought that you needed capital to create a company so most people who were starting businesses were from business families already had wealth and they were using that wealth and i did not have any ancestral wealth or anything like that so when i started seeing venture capital and private equity companies coming to india in the early 2000s it felt like this is the right time to start a company so that's that's what really led to my becoming an entrepreneur so for the people who are starting companies or who want to start a company or people who are in doubt whether i am an entrepreneur or not an entrepreneur i have some sobering news firstly entrepreneurship is not for everybody because entrepreneurship is a huge struggle to get to somewhere right unless you're going to have a lot of fun and you really have a lot of energy and you're willing to take a lot of setbacks feedback failure and you still have the passion left in you to build something that's when most people get successful you need luck you need a lot of other things to become successful so i would say that firstly that the odds of entrepreneurial success are low therefore do it only if you have a very high degree of passion very high degree of energy my thumb rule is if you can't wake up you if you can't think every waking minute that i should be an entrepreneur i'm wasting my time not being an entrepreneur that is the day you know that you're ready so till then wait it out you can you can be an entrepreneur at any age there's no rush and you can learn you can grow in experience you can learn on other people's money and then start your business so there is no rush and therefore take your time and only when that entrepreneurial bug has caught you and you feel like look i'm ready and once you're ready i have a few things that you should do first is do not do it in isolation find a co-founder and usually if you are the ceo type find the cto type in your kind of company right so one person is thinking of business and we thinking of people thinking of selling the other person is thinking of tech or the product so if you have that combination of a co-founder that's a good combination so find that kind of a co-founder and find someone who you really trust who you have really spent some time with and where even with failures 
you can really be together. So find that kind of person. If you work with someone for a long period of time, a classmate, a schoolmate, a, a good friend, uh, someone you know for a long period of time, I think those are good candidates for doing that. And certainly with the with the with that kind of a uh, let's say a skill that is complementary to your skill. The second thing I would tell you is work with your family. Tell your entire family and friends and every onboard everybody in that journey that you're an entrepreneur. Do not do it in a corner and think that, look, let me start this, let me not tell anybody, and once I'm successful, everybody will know. No. In fact, they are all going to help you become successful. So tell everyone, get their advice. Some of them will discourage you. I discourage a lot of people from entrepreneurship because I feel like they're not ready. So it's OK. Some of that feedback you absorb and see if you still have the energy left. So take everyone along because your friends, your family members, your parents, your spouse, they're all allies in your journey. Because eventually in your success, they have to come and help you out in, in, as you become an entrepreneur and successful. So that's the second thing I would do. And the third thing I would do is prepare for the journey by saying, by having at least 18 months of reserve money in your bank account. Think that for 18 months, you're not going to make any money. That is the least. It can get worse than that, but at least you have to have 18 months worth of money in your bank account. So you feel like, look, if I don't make any money, nothing works out, I can still pay my bills. I can still you know, uh, do the stuff I want to do. So have that money, and then you are ready to become an entrepreneur. And certainly, the idea is important. You, the idea has to consume you. You have to feel like this is a great idea. But the, I don't want to uh, overemphasize the quality of the idea. Most businesses become very successful not because they came with a terrific idea, but they took an idea which is not great, and they turned it into something like a great business and a much better idea. So idea is important, but ne not nearly as important as people make it out to be. What are some of the other lessons you would have learned from Mr. Narayan Murthy after meeting him there? This is now 26 years ago yeah. when I met uh, Narayan Murthy, so I don't remember a lot of the conversation yeah. I had. The thing I remember is that he seemed extremely down to earth. A $50 million company, there was not a small company in, in that way, right? It, in India was, was the 1990s. So for that, he was very humble. He was OK to admit his mistakes. And he was very confident of the vision he had. And he, he knew that he was building it for the long term and with the right ethics in place. These are the things that were very powerful for me, uh, especially because I came with the worldview that you know, entrepreneur was, was entrepreneurship was this hustle game where you have to, you know, find loopholes. You know, you, you, you have to cut corners and somehow try to success. He seemed like he was building it for the long term with the right value systems, with the right set of co-founders, mm -hmm. uh, with confidence but a lot of humility, which are all really amazing qualities for an entrepreneur. Right. And you know, like when you said, right, like entire family or maybe all the friends, they are a part of your journey. I can very well resonate with it. Like in my life, at least, there has been like two instances where when I was studying for my CA finals, it was not me. It was my family who was studying for my CA finals because they yeah. were equally a part of it. Today, when I am running my own company, it's like my family is also a part of it because they know the in, like they know the ups and downs. Yeah. They know in and out, like everything about what's happening yeah. and what's not. And I think it's equally important for them also to be involved right from the beginning rather than towards the end. That's so true because you may be the entrepreneur and you may be getting the returns, but everyone is suffering along with you. Exactly. They are all uh, handling your stresses and strains. They are handling their own stresses and strains, and they're supporting you in that. And you want them to cheerfully support you and really be a part of the journey. And like they say, behind every successful man is is a woman or or some things like that. There's a there's a wonderful family behind every successful entrepreneur. Right. And we underestimate that uh, in the way we think about the business. It's not a lonely game, especially yeah. because entrepreneurship can get very lonely. Yeah. Especially if you're alone and you're building this business, you can get very lonely. It can be depressing. One in two entrepreneurs through their entire uh, journey uh, has a period of depression. So given that situation, the more you are connected with your friends and family. Even friends are very important. So what happens in the initial entrepreneurial journey is, you know, it happened with me. I started Fractal, not earning any salary for a long period of time, obviously traveling economy class and, you know, not having enough money. It was really a struggle in the first few years. And you would see all your friends who were also graduated with you, they're all in fancy jobs. They're in, you know, flying. Obviously, they're flying sometimes business class. They're they they you can they're wearing expensive suits they have you know you can see that they're in a different life stage lifestyle they're obviously succeeding in big companies and you feel like i could have made those choices and so you tend to 
isolate yourself from your friends and say, look, look, I'm a struggling entrepreneur. Nobody wants to meet me. So let me just stay in a corner. And, and that's a bad decision. I think you should just be open out and just be comfortable in your, this is, I am an entrepreneur, it's cool. Back when I started, entrepreneurship wasn't very cool. Now entrepreneurship is very cool. I'm doing a startup is, is not a bad statement. So I would say just wear your entrepreneurship on your sleeves, get your friends and be comfortable with the fact that you are a, you know, a billionaire in the making. Right. Uh, so that's yeah. okay. That, that, that's very inspiring. I think a lot of people would get a lot of motivation after listening to that. Uh, like in terms of uh, analytics and AI, right? Like since Fractal is an analytics and AI driven company as well, I'm sure like a lot of uh, AI related conversations or analytics related conversation would also happen in the company because that's the uh, backbone of the company. So I wanted to ask you, what are your views about how is the entire artificial intelligence space going to span out in the next decade, especially as far as the careers of all the people are concerned? So how can it be a complement and not like a substitute for the careers of people? That's a wonderful question. Because in the last uh, 15 years or so, AI has been steadily becoming better. So the world of AI started in the 1950s when the, the term artificial intelligence was coined and this thing called Turing test was developed which said if when you can't distinguish whether you're having a conversation with a machine or a human, that's when the AI is really good. Right? So it's passed the Turing test. So, but from the 1950s up to, let's say, early 2000s, AI was not really so good. It, and we had lots of what were called AI winters and, and AI spring, but lots of AI winters where funding dried up and companies struggled, etc. Around the mid 2000s to around 2010, the first set of results started coming, which were very impressive. These were neural networks, but now they are called deep learning neural networks. And here, people were starting to see some very impressive results in speech recognition, image recognition, uh, natural language processing, they started seeing results which were better than the traditional ways of doing computer vision or traditional ways of doing speech processing. Neural networks were providing better results. They're still not close to human accuracy. But between 2010 and 2015, all of these things got so much better, they started beating human accuracy in a lot of very defined tasks. So you had in the game of Go, uh, DeepMind defeated, uh, Deep, Deep Mind defeated Lisa Doll, who was a world champion of Go. And then we had chess and lots of other games where AI started becoming better than humans. Then narrow tasks like image recognition, breast cancer detection, or, or uh, skin cancer detection, or let's say uh, tuberculosis detection from an x-ray. All of these places, narrow AI areas, AI started getting better than humans. So we entered the realm where for a specified task, it was no longer good enough to have a human expert, but an, a human expert assisted by, a, by an algorithm. So if I'm a radiologist, and I'm trying to find out whether somebody has a lung cancer based on the skin, skin on, based on their chest x-ray, you're better off if the, if the chest x-ray is processed by an AI and it gives you a report, and then you look at the report. And, and then you use your intelligence and then make a decision. That's when I think you can make a better decision than doing it alone. Because we've shown through results that you, you can actually, AI actually beats an average radiologist and maybe even as good as a top radiologist. So the combination therefore is a wonderful thing. So human plus machine really started taking off. Now, 2023, we've seen a massive increase in the predictive accuracy of AI through this new area called generative AI. Now generative AI is different from the the previous world of AI, which we can call as discriminative AI, where it's about answering a question, specifying a probability, skin cancer or not, is the right move, etc. right, in a chess game, etc. Now we're in a world where it can produce content on its own. It can write a poem for you. It can summarize a document for you. A lot of things that seemed very difficult in the pre-generative AI world are becoming very possible now. So suddenly we see a massive increase in productivity across a whole range of tasks. So if I'm doing any kind of data processing, if I'm writing content, if I'm uh, coming up with a new, a new creative ad for a, for a marketing campaign, each of these things, now I'm gonna use generative AI to help me create those first drafts, uh, sort of a co-pilot with me, a co-conspirator with me, a co-creator with me. When you do that, now instead of taking, let's say, 100 hours to do something, you might do it in 50 hours. Now, if you do that, if you need 100 people to do a certain job, you only need 50 people. So it really, it, the need for workforce could shrink. That is the, is the power of what is, is happening. So what you're seeing is that AI is getting really better. It is 
It is going to be of producing your first draft, summarizing data, driving productivity, bringing intelligence. An example I'll, I'll share with you is a gentleman called uh, Pete Cooper who did uh, tweeted about this. His dog was sick, and he went to a vet, and the vet tried to give him some, give the dog some medicines, and it turned out that medicines were not working. It had a, some kind of a tick-borne disease, and was dying. Then he decided to take all this information of the blood reports, etc., lab results, etc., and he put this in GPT-4, chat GPT, GPT-4. And it gave him some ideas, and then eventually asked her, asked, the, asked chat GPT, what do you think could be the underlying cause? And it gave two hypotheses. But the first one ended up being correct. So he went back to the vet and he said, hey, these are the two hypotheses. The vet said, yeah, I didn't think of this. This hemolysis that you're talking about, yes, it could be happening. I didn't, I didn't consider it. And then he put the dog on a drug regimen, dog got better. So oh, wow. you know, it, my sense is that in the next few years, it'll be irresponsible to not consult an AI before mm. making a big decision. That's the world we are entering. Right. And the world, so instead of fighting AI, of course, AI is going to get better. Tech gets better over time. AI is going to only get better in the next few years. It's not going to get worse from here. Right? So our best bet is to adapt and adopt, adapt to this environment and adopt AI and make it a co-conspirator in everything that we do. Make it your co-pilot in solving problems. Learn that stuff and then drive significant productivity gains in how you do things. Right? And that's the, that's the first thing we can do actually to, uh, to get better. And, uh, and then over time, what you will see is that there will be new professions that come up. So eventually, some jobs will shrink. Take, for example, writing software code. Right? If, you, if you write software code, the software code productivity is very low in India or anywhere in the world. People write maybe 10, 20 lines of clean code in a single day. Now, with generative AI, it can, you, can, you can ask a question in English, and it will write code for you right? in Python or whatever language, many languages. So really, the num lines of code that you can write can increase by 50 60% in a single day, which means that 5.5 million Indian IT professionals, you may need only 2.5 to write the same amount of code. So that's the kind of big changes that are happening, both in writing code, testing, debugging code, and even in uh, documentation. All these areas, you're seeing the value of AI coming through. So if I'm a tech professional right now, I absolutely must use AI to increase the productivity of writing code, but then I have to get better and see what is it that I should do to stay relevant in this industry for the next few years. So that is that is really what we have to think of. New jobs will get created. New demand will get created. Because once you can write the same amount of code in half the time, it's not that the need for tech in the world is going to come down. People will do much, much more tech. And all kinds of brilliant innovation will happen. You'll see productivity increases. But this will have some kind of a transition effects where some jobs will go, more jobs will come in, and eventually we'll get to a much better place. And this is not a new phenomenon. It's been happening since Industrial Revolution. It, it is somewhat painful in the, as a transition as it's happening. But for the youngsters here, you just have to embrace AI and just use it to drive advantage. And in the next 20, 30 years, this is going to really determine your career success as well. Right. Let me give you like a few examples of how like people in finance are using chat GPT and the similar tools. So for example, if let's say you want to read an annual report or you want to read an investor presentation in order to analyze data, right? A lot of times what, what happens is that we download the annual report, we'll read the entire report and then we'll do the analysis and all of that. But now like tools like chat GPT and there's also an AI tool called finchat.io, which I was just trying to experiment what is it about. You just type analyze the last earnings of Microsoft or Tesla and just give like four insights from that entire report and all of yes. that and it'll give you crisp insights one by one yes. and if you don't like it you again regenerate a response and it'll give you better insights as well Fantastic. so i think people are literally trying to save a lot of their time where they used to read like entire investor presentation yeah. con call earnings transcript annual reports which is now like saving a lot of time and they're just reading the answers which are given by these ai tools yeah so that is something which is happening in the finance space yeah we're all uh, dealing with uh, too much information right? right for example i'm on a board of a company and we had a board meeting last week and all the materials we I got two days before the board meeting, they were 557 pages. <laughs> and I mean, these are board meeting documents are very boring. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I literally would have slept through the whole thing if I had to read everything. Yeah. But if, I mean, this is, now we can't always do it because of confidentiality and other reasons, but if you could use uh, AI to summarize that 557 pages, yeah into the most important ones, you will save a lot of time. And that time you can use for all other things. And certainly in, in case of finance, 
people are using AI left, right, and center. A for you know summarizing documents and asking. So you can ask basically interact with 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 uh, with with documents, which is great. Ask questions, get answers, and you can chat. PDF is one of those applications where you can upload any document and start asking questions. It will keep answering the questions from the documents. Oh, okay. so it's really really useful. Right. And then people are also using AI to invest in stock markets. They're using yeah. AI to use all of the data and figure out which stocks to invest in. So there's a brilliant, bright future ahead right. of of us in, in terms of AI. No, in fact, even YouTube has now integrated with ChatGPT. And if you go on YouTube videos, right, like left on the left side, there's a logo of ChatGPT, and then you can click. And if you don't want to watch the entire one hour or two hours video, exactly. ChatGPT will create a very proper summary of that video. And then if you don't like that summary, again, you can regenerate another res another response, and then it'll give you another kind of summary as well. Perfect. So that was something which I was like, I mean, yeah, this is something which is exactly because crazy. we all have different learning styles. Yeah. Right. So some of us uh, like reading. Some of us like watching, and some of us like listening. So yeah. that, and we try to. I mean, and now you can really convert any format. Or you can take a book and make it an audio book. You can yeah. audio book and you can make it text. You know that sort of flexibility also really helps you in in processing the content the best way that you want to process it. Right. Since you're talking about books, we've also got to know that you are like a very avid book reader, and you read a lot of books in uh, like in the last few. Read like a lot of books as well. So uh, how like uh, like just to ask you like how many books would you have read in the last one year? Definitely more than hundred. Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> the number lot. is definitely higher than hundred. Mm -hmm. I have over the years developed a system to increase my reading uh, overall reading. Do you use but, AI to read these books? <laughs> uh, not yet, not yet, not yet. I'm not summarizing, but there are summary services available. I don't. Yeah. Uh, I use some of those summary services, but I actually want to read the full book. Mm -hmm. I don't think I learn enough. And I don't retain what I learn if I don't read the full book. Yeah. So I do read all of the books in full. What I do is, I used to read about 50 books a year. I think for the last 15 years or so, I've been reading at least 50 books a year in most wow. years. There have been some years maybe I've read less. But over the last, since COVID, my reading has gone up a lot because I think COVID gave me a little extra time and then I have kept that pace even post-COVID. So I'm at averaging 100 plus books a year. What I do with, with this is, you know, I try to read about 10 books in parallel at any point of time, meaning I have 10 books that I'm reading depending on the mood of the day. So if I feel like reading a certain, I look at the books and I know which book I feel like reading right now. So I don't push myself, but I find it very, I'm very curious to learn. I enjoy it. Sometimes I read the whole book in one sitting. Sometimes I read in, in over months. Uh, sometimes I would uh, drop a book if I'm not learning much from the book. So I, I, I go with my energy. I let my energy direct how many books to read, which book to read, rather than pushing myself to read more than I should. But over time, I've realized that there's a lot of joy. You know, somebody has spent their entire career in doing something, and she or he is summarizing their learnings into one book, and they sell it for 200 rupees or 500 rupees or something like that. I feel like it's one of the cheapest ways to grow and learn, and I, I make the full use of, uh, of those kinds of books. Okay. So I read memoirs. Uh, which are very useful of people who are autobiographies and memoirs where of people who have succeeded or people who have who I really admire. Then I read uh, fiction. I certainly read a lot of uh, science uh, and math books. For example, a lot of health and longevity and uh, ex exercise. Those kinds of books I read. Uh, you know, certainly business books and books on AI and so on. So it's a wide palette. I try to and I, re I every time some a friend recommends a book to me, I absolutely. Will it, if I really trust the friend, I will definitely do the book that she or he is recommending because I, f I find I get to experience new books in this way. So this is how I've built the palette over the years, but I think I would recommend book reading to anybody. It is, yes, podcasts and maybe YouTube is a faster way to learn, and for some people that, that works. I think the deeper you can go, a book can give you a, the kind of depth Super, unlike uh, podcasts and YouTube, etc., they can be superficial sometimes. But books can let you go into the deep end of the things and explore it and give you time to process it. So, it's a combination of all of these devices actually is very helpful. I know you're writing a book, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to reading that one too. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think like thanks to you as well for uh, becoming a part of that book. Like it's going to release on 15th of August. Let's see how it goes. But uh, yeah, hopefully it's like a good activity, which I have realized when you went out something, when you write it out, it's like you went out some feelings. And I think yeah. that is something which helps you also in order to stay confident and stay motivated, whatever you want to do ultimately. That is something which I have uh, realized over the last few years, like reading as well as writing. Both of this, like both yeah. of these habits are something that have really helped me a lot in order to become more patient, more focused and more concentrated towards what I want to do ultimately. 
I, I envy your uh, the fact that you've written a book. I've been wanting to write a book for a long time. So good job on writing a book. It's a, it's a wonderful yeah. thing. No, no. We, I mean, I'm sure like uh, you'll also write a book in the next one or two <laughs> years itself, and we can't wait to read that. But uh, do you also read books on uh, artificial intelligence? I'm sure like you must be. Reading. I do. I do read uh, books. Unfortunately, so, they're not. I mean, in uh, the books on AI are either too high level. Okay. Where I feel like you are, you know, I already know uh, most of it, or if not all of it, or they are just technical books in uh, in terms of they, they are just helping you a technique or something like that. They're academic books, which are also helpful. I think there's not a lot in between, got it, got it. which may be which may be even more helpful to me. But I do still read them because I, I find value in even if I learn a, one new thing yeah. or a new story. I only pay ten dollars for it, so it doesn't matter. Right, but if yeah. someone wants to know more about AI, and if someone is like me who doesn't have like any th any knowledge about artificial intelligence, what are like some of the best three books which you would recommend for us, so that we can also start off and we can get to know more about this space which is booming? I would say there's a book called Artificial Intelligence: A Modern Approach by uh, Peter Peter um, and Russell Stewart, Peter Norvig and Russell okay. Stewart. Okay. That is probably the best book on AI. It's this thick. Okay. It's it's academic book. It's one of the it's the most uh, referred to textbook in the history of computer science books. It's okay. really good book. Uh, I would recommend it highly. And for anyone who's seriously into understanding it, there's a lot of good content in that book. Then I think the Master Algorithm by Pedro Dominguez is I think it's a very good introduction to people who are new to AI but want to learn it. It's it's a good book. Um, and uh, there are a few other good ones. One, the one called T minus AI, which is also a good book. There are quite a few decent books, Got it. Uh, which which are there. But these three, I would I would think of as books that are definitely worth reading. Got it. Makes sense. And uh, like one thing which I wanted to always ask you is that now, like since of course you have achieved so much and you have already like built a company which is worth twelve thousand crore rupees today, one point five billion dollars in market cap. And the revenues have scaled significantly. You're also profitable, which is also like one of the big things because most of the unicorns in India are not, are not like are loss making, and uh, they are on their path to profitability. So, what always keeps you going, and what is something that always helps you in order to stay on your toes 24/7? See, first thing is that I think Jeff, as Jeff Bezos of Amazon says, customers are always wonderfully dissatisfied. So. If you have built a business that is truly focused on your customers, in which case we, we call them as clients, our clients, they are always pushing you to do more. They have beautiful, wonderful problems that we have to solve, and they are never truly happy. So it pushes us to learn and be on our toes. And we are only as good as we are the capability of our, our problem solving. So that is helpful. Second, I think in general, running a business is full of challenges. Every day something happens. You can never have a day where you feel like you know it's it's boring it, it, it's it's always interesting there's always stuff happening and as the business grows the kinds of challenges change and and you have to grow with the business to be able to lead it i have seen that every time i have grown as a person i've been able to grow fractal as well so the entire journey is i need to grow because i know that i am right now not good enough to run the company that I already have founded, so let me grow so that I can go fractal to the next level. So that's how I've always processed it, and I've seen that working with people is very energizing. Right? So there are 4,000 people at Fractal, and you know the kinds of questions that they have, the kind of culture building that is involved in creating a large company is just absolutely fascinating. And this complexity changes with scale, but at every scale, the biggest thing is what is the culture? Meaning, how to get things done here? Get things get done here? Is it really, uh, is, we are saying we are client-centric. Are we really client-centric? Are we going to put a client's interest first? What does it mean to be client-centric? Are we really oriented towards people? What does it mean to say that it's an open culture or this culture of transparency? It's a culture of trust. When you ask those kinds of questions, what you do every day and how you, what is happening when you're not watching are all signs of whether that culture is in place or not. So what do you do today so that when you're not around and things are happening inside the organization, it's a very complex organization with 4,000 people, that these principles that we think are important to us are being practiced every day. So that whole thing is just, you know, it's, it's just amazing. It's, it's fascinating right. to see that in action and, and to play some role in shaping that. Right, makes yeah. sense. So like the team of 4,000 people you said, so out of like 4,000, how many would be sitting in this office, which is there, the Mumbai one? This office has a capacity for about uh, 800 odd people. Got it. Uh, 
only 100 people show up in a given day because of <laughs> post covid i think we have been yeah. working remotely right. but in general uh, this can house up to 800 to 900 people in this office got it yeah the reason i asked you was because i mean i was odd when i just entered entered here and like the entire setting atmosphere which is there it gave me a very positive vibe as if you know like i would want to come here and work here so that was something which i like which i got a vibe when i entered this office we, we would love to have you I, i don't think we can afford you given all the amazing <laughs> things you're doing but i'd love to give you a tour if you're if you yeah if definitely you, yeah, that, that'll be amazing if you can just walk us through the office yeah let's do it best. yeah perfect let's do it Uh, this is one of i mean there's a lot of focus on learning as i said right. so this is a place where we can hold any training workshop and of course it's a it's a regular training room with all sorts of touch screens and everything but the good news is that this is something that where we can teach and learn across fractal locations so there are similar offices similar rooms in every fractal office so they can when they dial into this all the cameras automatically create a very good learning experience as if you were in the room right so these are all connected uh, rooms for learning right we call this hogwarts yeah. this is a school of learning i i'm sure you would teach here as well right i have taught a course called machine learning to make better decisions okay a full course for uh, which had about 60 fractalites that was the capacity we could handle yeah i have taught the same course at plaksha university as well okay which is uh, it i can teach it at a un- undergrad level or a grad school level or even at an executive level as well got it i've i've tried doing that so if i were to ask you between a teacher and an entrepreneur what would you describe yourself as you know, i would love to be a teacher okay <laughs> uh, and i think at some point of time i would want to teach more than i am teaching right now oh is it yes wow. uh, though i think i'm now an entrepreneur Yeah. more than anything else <laughs> but I'd love to teach right got it yeah i think our passionate teacher is always yeah. like he has that towards his students and all of that yeah and you know the fact that you can if you shape a young mind they yeah. can do something amazing and wonderful yeah. you have the opportunity to the multiplicative effects of education are huge correct so that is why you know plaksha university because i thought founding a university can create you know thousands and thousands of great entrepreneurs and great success stories right. which alone i mean can sh- i can shape a few few thousand people at fractal but this can shape literally the whole right. nation which is just right. quite amazing correct that's why super inspiring your mindset about mentoring young entrepreneurs <laughs> yes that's very yeah, inspiring I, i feel like you know you know sometimes it's like a it's like a coach right uh, what happens is that i had a situation where my coach marshall goldsmith the uh, first time i met him he took 15 minutes and in 15 minutes he figured out what my problem was and he told me i changed my life similarly if you are a you are a good bowler and you have one you know a couple they comes and looks at you and tells you hey this one thing you're not doing well and you change that and you suddenly you're you're you are a great bowler from a good bowler right that can happen so a little input goes a long way a great entrepreneur if you can see and give them that one tip then they can you know just overcome an obstacle and go to the next level the I mean not it doesn't happen all the time but the power of coaching or power of mentoring is huge right yeah. i agree okay yeah but they look very nice actually yeah exactly you know many many lives in the mumbai train system okay so the idea is that 10 people die every day crossing the ra- railway oh tracks in God. mumbai seriously yes so it's this. the largest cause of death in the city of mumbai in which is violent cause of death so 3000 people every year my so god so this happens because people underestimate the speed of large objects evolution hasn't taught us that large objects can move very fast so we underestimate the speed we think we can cross the cross the tracks and unfortunately accidents happen so what we did was to create this design solution these yellow lines there mm-hmm. so because you see those yellow lines it gives you a quick reference at the speed at which the yellow lines are disappearing under the train Oh okay. and you feel like it's coming fast. Okay. It gives you a much better sense of the speed than the train itself. Wow. And that's how many people avoid it has reduced the number of deaths by about 50%. Wow. Yeah. That's a it's, lot. It's it's very very important. And there are wow. a few others that are like that. I'll I'll show, show right. you every uh, every office that we have, every floor that we have yeah. has an open library. Okay. And we want it's fractal is a lot about in, in learning right yeah. so books have to be accessible to everybody right. anybody can go pick any book and read it and return it so right. 
books are always there everywhere so we won't surround ourselves by right. books i'll give you a copy of my book <laughs> i'll request you to place of it here of course we would love it yes, yes, yes. <laughs> absolutely we should buy many copies of your book <laughs> you know, this is this is like a very i mean i don't know it gives a very positive vibe a very fancy office yeah I'll show you. These lights are also very lucrative. I mean, these are lights uh, are all built yeah. for uh, exactly for well-being of the people, okay. and they're you know they're well designed for that reason. Got it. Oh, not this one. Nowadays, oh wow, we talked about content oh, right. creation. <laughs> In content here. Mm. Okay. So all of the uh, fractal is you know building courses on Coursera, okay, etc. On generative AI and other subjects. So these are right. all being shot here. We can okay. actually do a full podcast or. Or a guest show here as well, record a show like that. Right. So the idea is with this, we just created this recently. After COVID, especially this, this has really gone up. The usage right. of this has gone up. Yeah, this looks very nice. So, what are these courses about? Like, it's more about AI yes, tools have, and all of that. Yes, a bunch of courses okay. on AI. We have uh, one is uh, called Generative AI for Everyone, which okay. is free for everyone on on Coursera. Mm. And we are uh, coming up with another course on problem solving and AI. Okay. Uh, part of the course I am also teaching. Got which it. is uh, which is on on Coursera. It's going to be released in the next one month. Wow, very interesting. So this is our uh, what we call as is singularity. This room is called singularity. Right. This we call as the ideation studio. Right. And the idea here is that we should be able to have a creative brainstorming session. You see right. the shape of this table, and it's it's sort of not a usual shape. It's an unusual shape. Right. Because what we don't want is a confrontation in a in a brainstorming session. We don't want people to face off each other. When the table is shaped like a rectangle, people are, if you know, are antagonistic to each mm. other. But when right. nobody is looking at each other directly, right. there is more collaboration that happens. You see oh, wow. lots of whiteboards, yeah. you see big screens, and overall high ceilings, which are all sort of enable us to, and lots of natural lighting, which makes it very constructive for board, for for any board meeting or for brainstorming and so on. So that's really the idea of this room. Correct. This this is shaped like a little pinball. If you see yeah. the little games that you played as a child, when Correct. you throw a ball and it has to come and lodge itself somewhere, yeah. it's like our uh, sort of idea of solving complex problems right. using data and math. So this is just right. a tip of the hat for for that. This is very fancy. One question I had for you was: I see a ring light here, by the way. So I wanted to ask you: Are you becoming a content creator? Do you plan <laughs> on becoming a creator? I, I don't think I'm, I'm, <laughs> I will make the cut. But this is for uh, we do a weekly town hall meeting. Okay. Uh, every every Wednesday, right. we spend 90 minutes answering questions okay. uh, from fractalites, mm. and all questions are okay. And usually it's uh, later in the evening, so I put that light on as I'm okay. on that Zoom call. Uh, this, I mean, to the question that we are discussing <laughs> about culture, right. transparency is one of those things. So we have every every week 90 minutes answering questions, and that's how we've built that culture. Anybody can ask any question. All questions are upvoted on Slido. And we pick all the important questions and answer them, no matter how hard they are, and we put all the information out. And the, the documents we present to our people, to our board of directors, and to our clients are all the same. Wow. So there's so it, that is that just makes it a very transparent organization. So in these 90 minutes, like people can ask any sort of questions. And any questions. Like to the senior leadership. Yes. So oh, okay. questions can be asked in advance, which will be on Slido, and on the Zoom call, they can ask a question live. Uh, and if you ask a live question, we'll answer it. Every single oh, okay. question is answered. What is the weirdest question? Do you remember? Which oh, there are you? you know questions like, you know what my reimbursement claim by was it? <laughs> what happened to that? To that kind of a question. Okay. To asking a question as, I don't think this leader is capable enough. This oh, in okay. our this business leadership is not good enough. You know what are we doing to doing about it? You know right. there are lots of questions. The que See, the point is by creating this freedom of expression and by letting people ask, we create a culture of accountability right. uh, and we create a sense of shared, you know, building this organization, which is very, very important. And this Correct. is the, for the new generation of the Gen Z, millennial Gen Z people, I think it's very important that they work for a company where they feel like they have a voice, where, they're, where the organization stands for something. So this is our attempt to create that. Right. No, very, very nice. It's firing. So let's, let's, yeah. uh, let's keep walking. Sure. So this is a huddle table. Okay. I mean, nowadays we have a remote organization, but pre-COVID, we used to all sit around this table every day right. at 11.30 to 12.30 and let anybody come and ask a question, even during the day. So if they have any questions of the leadership, the leadership would come and sit, some of the leadership would come and sit and sort of work together for an hour and let's answer some questions. Got so it. that's just one one example. And these these are like awards for the company? All these yeah, these are all uh, some of the awards that we won recently okay. in, the, in the last one year. Okay. Um, so some interesting Got ones. It. Very, very nice. So you'll see those pillars there. Right? Yeah. So th 
that pill we every we have four floors in this office okay uh, five six seven and eight we are on the right. seventh floor right now right so this floor we have four values coincidentally so each value is coded into a pillar so the idea is that we have values but we don't have to put them on a wall and show them to everyone these are inside internal to us so mm. we have just have put them in in a binary code of zero one oh, wow. so you see that binary code there yeah it actually says client first because this is our one of our values client oh, okay. in binary okay, okay. Got and it. that pillar out there talks about john maynard Keynes' quote on what makes a great analyst okay that's that's the description his quote we have just repurposed it a little bit wow. so this is an example um so you see the office has you know 25 percent of the of this of the seats are sit stand right so because we want people to sit and not just sit but stand and and work as well and there's a lot of natural light Right. During the day, there's tremendous amounts of natural light in this office, which makes it healthier work environment. We are LEEDS Gold certified, uh, and in terms of the workplace uh, safety and and workplace employee well-being, etc. Right. This and yeah, I just wanted to ask this. So, yeah, yeah. what exactly? This looks very <laughs> fancy. This is our uh, visualization of hybrid between man and machine, okay. human and machine. And the idea here is that you know we, we actually wanted to create. I wanted to create actually half AI and half machine vertically like this, like mm. you've seen. Ardhanarishwar, right? You know, Ish, you know, Shiva and Parvati together in in one. We think we thought, okay, what if we had a human and machine together <laughs> in one? They, this is the this is the artist's uh, sort of creation of that idea. Okay, wow. Yeah. So, so a, whenever like people enter, they have to like do they greet? <laughs> this yeah, we, we have a lot of people come and take pictures. This is a, okay. one of our p favorite picture points at, at at the office. Right. This is this looks like a tourist spot only. <laughs> so let's let me take you further along. Sure, sure. How big would this office be in terms of square feet? Eight, yeah. I think it's about 125,000 square feet, I think. Oh, wow. So I think this is, uh, this is something that we're doing yeah. when an uh, important client visits us. We usually create their logo in a, in a beautiful way this way using oh, wow. uh, beads. It's just a, it's one way of respecting the clients that right. we serve. So no, I remember it. last time when I had come here, you had put here like, welcome Mr. Kushal Luda and I was, yeah. <laughs> I was shocked that exactly. this is such a warm welcome which I had received. Exactly. Right. These are some of the greatest mathematicians and computer scientists of the okay. last hundred years. We have, you know, good men and women who have created the field of AI and, okay. and, and who have contributed to the field of AI. Okay. So an example is uh, Grace Kelly is here. Um, yeah, we have um, Ada Lovelace, who's one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. These are this is Claude Shannon, who came up with information theory. So these are some wonderful, no. wonderful scientists these, and mathematicians. These are more like your role models, is it? Exactly. Like, these are people mm -hmm. who we are inspired by because they are the ones who created this space. Right. Uh, you can see, for example, I think this is uh, Grace Hopper. Hmm. Um, this is Marie Curie, Alan Turing. Another. Right. So these are the one who designed the Turing machine test, Turing test. Correct. So you can, and, and uh, we also have designed it for guests when they come in, we want them to have a good experience of fractal. So they can, the idea is that they can, if they're here, they can actually quickly get a sense of who fractal is. Oh, wow. So for example, if I say how, and it, oh, wow. it, it'll explain, it'll tell you some of the. Oh, wow. So this is my co-founder Pranay. Okay. So. How many co-founders are there in fact? Just uh, Pranay and I, the okay. two of us. Got it. Pranay is based in New Jersey. Okay. So, I'll, I'll just, and then you can you can just do a little bit of, you know, you can see what do we do here. Wow. Let's uh, say, what do we do in engineering, for example. So, it's it tells you a little bit. So, so I'll, wow. I'll just click that. Uh, and let's say, say, let's say, so let's say, what do we do in? Wow, this is very innovative. Yeah, that's just. Uh, they just to you know. Try it out yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> wow, intellectual. Of so the products that we have created. Is wow. Here. Just, uh, yeah. Very interesting. It looks more like a game, like yeah, exactly. Like a game so you, you know, you can spend the 10-15 minutes while you're if you're waiting for somebody. Yeah, correct. For example, solutions. <laughs> so wow. Just say, Things like that, yeah, very interesting. Only a free mind can fly. Wow. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's a uh, fractal, it's one of the thinking is that 
as ai gets better and better mm. right we will free up human time and when we, whenever we have freed up human time human beings have come up with new stuff right. we have come up imagine the new stuff if you are mm. too busy doing the the mundane stuff you cannot imagine the next so only when a bored free mind can create the next big thing mm. so b- my daughter's uh, school principal says that let your child be bored it's a very good thing being bored because okay. that's when they can think of the best ideas right that's yeah, the idea of of this very interesting and this is a, sorry it's, sorry What it's called it? middle earth okay it's actually our uh, sort of restaurant cafe okay. uh, coffee shop cafeteria mm. so we so right from the very beginning of fractal yeah we've served all meals in the office okay so breakfast lunch and evening snack okay. for everyone every day oh, wow. so we feel like you know people are doing their best work we just take every interruption out of the way right and food should be not one of those things that you should have to worry about when you are wow. in fractal so that's the idea very nice um and this 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 is i mean we we this this room can be divided into half we can sometimes hold town halls here okay and we also do some little events or you can become a yoga studio in the afternoon so there are various ways in which we use this area right and Basically. what are these tv screens for like this is so anything that's happening on that on that main screen it okay. it's is broadcast everywhere okay so any other messages you can have on on it as well Got like it. for example everything that we serve has a calorie count hmm. uh grams of fat protein everything is mentioned here so that people right. can take care of their diet and preferences and so on got it here we do a lot of behavioral science and design work hmm. you can see the books are also different yeah another library here they're very design books what is this book this thick one <laughs> this is good, good question <laughs> let's see it's got probably some my god <laughs> design classics wow yeah right boards right. see a bunch of post it notes there right it's like this is a space in which this team is trying to solve a problem right that's the idea don't you get confused after looking at so much content yeah but the idea book. of a post it note is that you have an idea and a, convic- a conviction and idea yeah. but only so much you can always remove the post it note and throw it Got so it. It, so that you don't get too stuck to your ideas yeah. that's why the post it notes wow but it's very systematic i mean the colors which are used as well as the yeah. colors of the sticky notes the marker and all of that it looks as if one uh, very smart like what do you call uh, that the person who has like sense of using colors and all they have done it exactly there are obviously yeah. a lot of behavioral science and design experts here i think you've had a lot of creative people as well yes yes <laughs> yes exactly a bunch of guys people are playing oh wow so we all, <laughs> there's always a fun element in fact right so people are playing table tennis right. they're playing foosball another uh, floor there's foosball some right. people are playing chess so right. different games and different floors right. but the idea is to do great work you sometimes also need to take breaks yeah and that's when your best energies can come out right so they playing these these people are playing at what 8:48 yeah. almost 9 o'clock in the night yeah that's that's the, tells you a little bit about Ev- the culture right? everyone comes in like casual it's right it's formal they're not it, mandatory we, see we used to have a very detailed dress code which went yeah. up to three pages at one point of time oh wow so <laughs> then we gave up on everything in okay. 2014 we said you know what we trust our people okay we had only one line dress code hmm. dress as if you want to meet a client ah, okay. that's it now you decide what that is and we will respect your choices okay so usually people are not going to come in shorts of course. or they're not going to come in chappals yeah But other than that i think people make up their own design their own aesthetics in right. terms of what they wear and right. we respect that and we're confident and we we just talk to any client but the okay. idea is come as if you're going to meet a client yeah. that is the only one line guidance correct so this is the the final stop for our tour today yeah so this is we have recreated alan turing's desk desk okay. right alan turing was one of the greatest mathematicians of our times yeah. he you know coined the phrase turing test right and uh, he wrote incredible papers he was one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence right unfortunately uh, he was targeted for being gay and fortunately he may have committed suicide towards the mm. end so his his life is incredibly powerful and yet poignant he was the one person because of which the allied forces were able to beat germans because he could decode hmm. through this uh, machine that he created uh, that that decoded all the messages the secret communication between the germans and he did the no. incredible math work and ai work which helped him do that hmm. so we recreated his desk this is the kind of typewriter he was working on this okay. is the kind of desk this is umbrella his is jacket and and this is a sort of picture of the map of where they were okay the equations that you see here are yeah. 
fractals equations of what we think will drive AI advantage. So we think results are a function of algorithms, engineering, and design. Error is a function of data, compute, computation, computation and techniques. So compute mm. data and techniques. Mm. So the, the, the more you have data, more compute and more technique, the error rate will be smaller, so you'll drive greater results. And if you want to be a great organization in terms of driving AI effectiveness, you need game-changing talent, a very open, transparent, and what we call as a positive error culture where error is celebrated, and a strong governance so that you don't do anything, you don't do big mm. mistakes. So you need a strong governance. So we feel these are the three equations that summarize how you can build a great organization using AI. Right. And we use that to how we solve problems. Right. So oh, these are our wonderful. equations, but the rest of it is all uh, Turing, and usually right. we take a picture here, and, uh, and that's that's what we do. Right. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed that tour. Definitely. I mean, I am just awestruck by the amount of uh, you know, like the amount of positivity which is there. That is something which is very uh, inspiring. And one which one last question which I have after looking at this entire office is like, <laughs> if you are comfortable, whether this is owned or <laughs> it's a rented space, like what is it? It is about? a rented office. Right. So we took a nine-year lease in okay. uh, 2020. Uh, 2019. Right. So we are here till 2028 and hopefully much beyond that. Right. Um, and what's the rent you're paying if you don't mind? We are paying 15% over 135. I think we took okay. it at 135 or 140 and now probably it's about close to 160 right now. Okay. So 160 per uh, rupees square per square feet. foot per month. Okay. And you mentioned it's 125,000 square feet. Yes. So if I do the math quickly, it's around one and a half CR a month kind of a thing. That's true. Got it. Very, very nice. Perfect. I think this was amazing, Shrikan. I mean, more than the podcast and uh, more than anything else, I think people are definitely going to love the entire vibe and culture yeah. which is there. It's definitely going to inspire a lot of them also if they are building something yeah. and if they can become this big, of course. These are like some of the things they should keep in mind while building their offices as well. Yeah, we've thought a lot about the culture yeah. in this building and we said, okay, if you know behavioral science and design, we should use that in our own office. Right. So, keep it uh, open. So that and make sure that people run into each other because that's where creative ideas come in. So everybody has to go to the sixth floor so that they can have lunch together. So oh. they all meet each other. There's there are a few points of the day then they run into each other, right. and that increases collaboration. So fractal is a team sport. So there are many of these small things that have been thought through in the way we've designed this office, and hope that is coming through in the way we are actually solving problems. Definitely. For our One last question before we end yeah. this entire podcast and shoot is that. If you were in the shoes of Kushal and if you were interviewing Shrikan, what is that one question which you would like to ask him towards the end of the interview? Mm -hmm. When is Fractal going public? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and maybe you can answer that. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a hard question. <laughs> Hopefully, sometime soon. Right. Uh, we, we, we really think of, we are building Fractal for the long term. I really think Fractal should be, success is for me is if Fractal is around 100 years from now. Right. When certainly Shrikant is not going to be around. So what can I do today so that Fractal is there, is an institution that will be there 100 years from now? That inspires me a lot because you create something that lasts beyond you. Hmm. And part of that is also being public because if you are a public company, we have to serve not just the shareholders, but the entire society, right? Stakeholders, the environment and our people, our clients, everyone. And there is those checks and balances of a public company that come into place, which I really like. Hmm. That is one of the mechanisms that will help us being to be around 100 years from now. I don't right. want to sell to some big company or a private equity shop mm -hmm. and which will break it up or combine it. A public company has that potential of being there for the next 100 years. And right. really, I like uh, the idea of Fractal being public sometime soon. And when was Fractal started? We started in 2000, so it's okay. been 23, it's been years, 23 of years of the journey. Right. Yeah, I think I was very young when I started. Yeah. <laughs> I how old, how old I was you? 25 years old when I started oh, Fractal. Okay. Okay, I feel, I can resonate, I am 24 right now <laughs> when I am starting something. But exactly, yeah, and that see. is one of the reasons also, I, when I, in terms of the culture of trust, in most fractalites are between 23 and 27 okay. years of age. Got it. I feel like, look, each one of them is a potential entrepreneur who could, could start a fractal-like company. Mm -hmm. And because the world trusted me, I could create fractal. So, we have to trust, we have to assume that each one of fractalites is also equally capable. And therefore, let's give them an environment where we don't have to micromanage them. Mm. I was very responsible when I was 25, and I think all fractalites are. So, create a culture where nobody is watching over anybody, everybody is doing the right thing, and just extend that kind of uh, trust and no micromanagement. The right. dress code we discussed, right? Exactly yeah. that reason. People are adults, they take care of themselves, and if you trust them, they somehow wonderfully reciprocated. Right, I agree. 
Thank you so much, Shikan, for doing this. It was wonderful hosting you. This is like one of the unique ways of uh, podcasting which I have done today. Thank you so much for no, allowing me to do it's that. It's wonderful experience. And a great idea to, yeah, to, to do this. But yeah, thanks, tour. thanks a lot, and uh, I'm sure like everyone's going to love this. Thank you so much. I hope I could do justice to your time. No, no, one, uh, it's been a fascinating yeah. conversation. Thank you, Kushal. Thank you, you so much. Shikan. Thanks. Yes, thanks.